If you're under the misconception that I actually took the time to tidy up my room so I'd have a neat space where I filmed, you're wrong! I just took everything on the futon and shoved it aside, which is honestly a really bad habit that I need to start working on. Hello my darlings, I go by Lucia and welcome back to my little corner of booktube. The book I'll be reviewing for today's video is The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. I sadly do not have a physical copy of it because I downloaded it onto my iPad. Which sucks because I can't flaunt the book for all of you to see and accidentally hold it upside down. But hey, at least I'm able to read this book in the first place. Now, I have a complicated relationship with Sylvia Plath's work. Because when I was younger, I'd only see snippets and bits and pieces of her work out of context, and I'd immediately jump to thinking, ugh, not another one of those stupid poets who goes on about the inherent suffering of being a woman and is praised for being so deep and profound. I'm not like that. I'm a girl, and I like being a girl and being girly, and I read Yates. If you couldn't tell, 14 to 15 year old me was a bit of a pretentious, judgmental twerp, and if I had the ability to go back in time and give little Lucia a stern talking to about that sort of behavior, believe me, I would. So once I started looking into the context in which a lot of Plath's work was written, I started to realize, yeah, I was being very judgmental about that. I suppose my reading The Bell Jar is an attempt to reconcile those notions, as well as the fact that a lot of people in general, specifically professors and fellow students, have recommended this book to me and said it's quite good. So, what did I think of The Bell Jar? Well, we'll be discussing that in today's review. As always, there will be spoilers. If you're interested in checking out this book for yourself and want to go in blind, I'd recommend you do so before pressing on in this review. Have we gotten all that out of the way? Good, let's proceed. I think that it is important to understand that the bell jar is a very character-driven story. To those of you who may have heard this term but not quite understand it, and that's fine, I didn't really get what the term meant either, Google helpfully defines character-driven as when something about the character's essential self leads to a particular action or event in the story, as opposed to a plot-driven story, which is when a character takes a particular action so that the result is a particular plot point. The Bell Jar is set in the early 1950s and follows 19-year-old Esther Greenwood. At the start of the book, she is working in New York under an internship at a glamorous publishing company. She and the other girls get lots of gifts from sponsors and plenty of opportunities to travel, and she should be happy about it, but that's not really the case. Though Esther doesn't begin attempting suicide until a little while after her return home, it is very apparent even as early as her time in New York that she is struggling with mental illness. I knew something was wrong with me that summer, because all I could think about was the Rosenbergs and how stupid I'd been to buy all those uncomfortable expensive clothes, hanging limp as a fish in my closet, and how all the little successes I'd totted up so happily at college fizzled to nothing outside the slick marble and plate glass fronts along Madison Avenue. Much of the plot focuses on Esther's relationships with those around her, and how her own struggles with mental illness affect those interactions. Her fellow intern, Doreen. Her mother. Her sort of boyfriend, Buddy Willard. Joan, one of the girls she meets at the hospital. She goes through electroshock therapy, is patronized by her own mother, and feels trapped with no way of getting proper help. She's miserable, frustrated, wants a way out. While The Bell Jar is by no means a light and fluffy read, its ending feels rather hopeful. Esther is going to be going through an evaluation to see if she will be able to leave the hospital. We never find out what actually happens, but here are the last few paragraphs. Pausing for a brief breath on the threshold, I saw the silver-haired doctor who had told me about the rivers and the pilgrims on my first day, and the pocked, cadaverous face of Miss Huey, and eyes I thought I had recognized over white masks. The eyes and the faces all turned themselves toward me, and guiding myself by them, as by a magical thread, I stepped into the room. There was something about Esther's final reflection on her experiences that comes off to me as though she is eventually going to get better. I will say, though, that I actually appreciate the open ending we're given, as opposed to Plath making it more explicit as to whether or not Esther is able to recover and move forward in life. To have given us an unambiguously happy or sad ending would have made me feel cheated. Plus, I tend to like ambiguous endings. <coughs> East of Eden. So, 
The bell jar is an interesting concept that is executed well. While I don't think it resonated with me in the same way it did with other readers, and make no mistake, I'm not being nitpicky or saying the plot is poorly executed, I can recognize its importance and appreciate it from a technical standpoint. I saw my life branching out before me like the green fig tree in the story. From the top of every branch, like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband and a happy home and children, and another fig was a famous poet, and another fig was a brilliant professor, and another fig was E.G., the amazing editor, and another fig was Europe and Africa and South America, and another fig was Constantine and Socrates and Attila and a pack of other lovers with queer names and offbeat professions, and another fig was an Olympic lady crew champion, and beyond and above these figs were many more figs I couldn't quite make out. I saw myself sitting in the crotch of this fig tree, starving to death, just because I couldn't make up my mind which of the figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest. And as I sat there, unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black, and one by one they plopped to the ground at my feet. This is, perhaps, the most well-known passage from The Bell Jar. I feel like even if you haven't actually read it, there's definitely a good chance you may recognize the fig tree metaphor. It is amusing that comes from the main character of the novel, Esther Greenwood. There is something to be said in how Esther, a mentally ill character, is written. Around the time the bell jar was first published, the representation of the mentally ill in pop culture left much to be desired. And I mean, it still does, but this was especially the case in the 1960s. The mentally ill were portrayed as violent killers, bloodthirsty and lost to reality. That or their entire personal tragedies revolved around them being mentally ill. This is something that really doesn't apply to Esther. Firstly, she's not a violent killer or delusional by any means. It's true that her depression is a hugely important part of her story, but the fig tree metaphor emphasizes that it is not just Esther's depression that contributes to the conflict. It's the environment she is a part of that make her condition worse. Esther herself has a personality beyond depressed. She wants to be a writer. She has her moments of snarky jokes, especially in regards to her distaste towards Technicolor movies, something I firmly disagree with her on. You can pry the likes of Meet Me in St. Louis and Cat on a Hot Tin Roof from my cold, dead hands. She's a big eater and seemed to be close to her grandfather before she left for New York. The joke was that at my wedding, my grandfather would see I had all the caviar I could eat. I was a joke because I never intended to get married, and even if I did, my grandfather couldn't have afforded enough caviar unless he robbed the country club kitchen and carried it off in a suitcase. I'm not entirely sure if this was Plath's intention or not, but as I read the bell jar I felt extremely isolated from the other characters. They were present and distinct, especially Esther's eventual psychiatrist, Dr. Nolan, who is a rare example of a fictional doctor who properly listens to her patient and validates her feelings, but... It was hard to really get attached to the other characters. I can't discern whether or not this was a deliberate choice, but if it was, it feels like an effective way of getting inside of Esther's head. I'm close to friends and family members with depression, several of whom have brought up feeling similarly detached from the people around them. I'd say two characters in particular stuck out to me that weren't Esther. The first was Buddy Willard, who is Esther's sort of boyfriend. As she gets to know him better, she realizes he's not as close to the idealized version of him she thought him to be. He doesn't take her ambition seriously, and seems to view Esther as less of a person, more of an idea. An idea of what the ideal 1950s wife should look like. My trouble, Esther decides, was that I took everything Buddy Rollo told me as the honest-to-God truth. Still, that doesn't stop Buddy from being somewhat sympathetic. Though his character is a scathingly critical representation of the gender roles present during that time, he ends up getting tuberculosis and takes Esther to the hospital even when his colleagues believe women shouldn't be allowed in. And towards the end of the book, it seems like the two try to reconcile with one another, conveyed through Buddy saying, Let me fly with you. The next character would be Joan Gilling. Joan Gilling came from our hometown and went to our church and was a year ahead of me at college. She was a big wheel president of her class and a physics major and the college hockey champion. She always made me feel squirmy with her starey pebble-colored eyes and her gleaming tombstone teeth and her breathy voice. Like Esther, Joan is an overachiever. Like Esther, Joan ends up hospitalized. First around the same time as Esther, then again even though she'd been released earlier. Unlike Esther, we know what happens to her. She leaves the grounds after returning to the hospital and kills herself. 
Jones and Mia are character to Esther with one key difference, something Esther reflects on at her funeral. I took a deep breath and listened to the old brag of my heart. I am. I am. I am. Joan is not. Earlier in the book, Esther catches Joan in an embrace with another one of the hospital patients, Dee Dee. An explicitly romantic moment where afterwards Esther asks Dr. Nolan why two women would want to be together, and is answered with tenderness. On the one hand, when I first read this, I got a sinking feeling about Joan's eventual fate, being a little too familiar with a barrier gaze trope, as well as the fact that this was written in 1962. On the other hand, Joan is written as a painfully sympathetic character in spite of Esther's repulsion towards what she's seen. Furthermore, the exact circumstances leading up to Joan's suicide are left rather ambiguous, and it is very common for suicidal people to experience relapses even after long periods in which their conditions seem to be improving. The Belchar's characters are sympathetic and make for interesting commentary on the extremely strict gender roles and stifling societal expectations of the time period it is set in. But, again, I just don't think I really connected to Esther in the same way many other readers seem to. She does go through a lot of genuinely heavy experiences and is a very sympathetic portrayal of a mentally ill character, as well as being a well-written character in general. But I never really felt as attached to her or any of the other characters in spite of that. Though I've consistently brought up how I don't really relate to or connect with the bell jar the same way I have with other books, it is most definitely well written. Plath is a writer who has managed to find a happy medium between too much detail and not enough. She knows how to create very vivid, specific imagery, but not to the point where it bogs the reader down. This applies especially in regard to how she describes characters' appearances. For example, Doreen came from a society girls' college down south and had bright white hair standing out in a cotton candy fluff around her head, and eyes like transparent agate marbles, hard and polished and just about indestructible, and a mouth set in a sort of perpetual sneer. I don't mean a nasty sneer, but an amused, mysterious sneer, as if all the people around her were pretty silly and she could tell some good jokes on them if she wanted to. She gives a few brief lines of description regarding Doreen's appearance, then goes on to weave aspects of who she is and how she comes across into how she looks. Another thing I appreciate about Plath's work is how she's able to capture very specific emotions. Not necessarily emotions that I can relate to, but certainly a skill I appreciate that is hard to master in writing. There is something demoralizing about watching two people get more and more crazy about each other, especially when you are the only extra person in the room. It's like watching Paris from an express caboose heading in the opposite direction. Every second the city gets smaller and smaller, only you feel it's really you getting smaller and smaller and lonelier and lonelier, rushing away from all those lights and that excitement at about a million miles an hour. What I like about how Plath conveys emotion is even if I can't necessarily relate to her work, I really do like how viscerally specific she is with her metaphors regarding emotions. It comes off as deliberately brutal in a really unconventional way, displaying some of the most beautiful writing I've ever seen. I respect her work for that. Trying to describe how I feel about the bell jar is a difficult task. I already mentioned that I felt my reading this book was an attempt to reconcile my misconceptions regarding Sylvia Plath and her legacy. After learning about the fact that she was a mentally ill abused woman living in the 1950s, who felt stifled and unable to pursue her ambitions because they went against societal expectations, I began to rethink what I'd initially learned. It's safe to say that I respect Plath as a writer now that I have read her work and learned a bit more about her. I don't think I love The Bell Jar as much as other readers do, however. I just feel like it really didn't click with me or resonate with me. I appreciate a lot of the very deliberate choices that were a part of the novel, strongly appreciate Plath's skill as a writer, and recognize its merit and importance. At the same time, though, I didn't really care for it. Nothing like hatred or dislike, I simply didn't really feel as connected to it as I thought I would. I would like to point out that I am a firm believer in the idea that you can dislike or not care for a book and still recognize its merit, be it classic literature or contemporary work. With this book, I think, such is the case for me. Thank you all for watching. I'm actually hoping we can have a discussion about the bell jar in the comments section. What did you think of it? Was there anything I might have missed? Was there anything that you noticed that I might have misinterpreted? What did you walk away with it from? I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts and having a civil but thought-provoking discussion. Did I just use the word thought in two sentences? Yes. But am I too lazy to edit this clip or redo it? Yes.
Links to my social media will be in the description below if you're interested in following me on other platforms. I hope you're all having a good day, and if not, it gets better. Bye!